Campfire Classics is a classic literature podcast. However, your hosts will occasionally use not-so-classy language and immature humor to describe very mature situations. As such, listener discretion is advised. Hi, I'm Ken Sandberg. And I'm Heather Michelle Lawler. Welcome to Campfire Classics, where we try to read those books that look really good on your shelf. I no longer have the plague, so here we are, back with you. (laughs) Yeah, hey listeners, thanks for bearing with us as we um, missed last week. It always sucks to miss, but sometimes health has to come first. Yeah, I was not doing great last <laughs> week. Uh, I came down with, I'd been hearing about it because I was taking a exercise like class, like a fitness class through home, like through Zoom. And a lot of them were up in New York and people kept like getting sick in New York and they were calling it like the worst flu or like the the death cold or the the plague of 2023 or whatever and i was like oh that sucks and then those are some intense names i went up to new the york death cold. <laughs> the death cold um and there were days it felt like that uh <laughs> uh but i went up to new york and like had a night on the town and then within a couple days started to go uh, 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 and then like it hit i went up to new york Again, for three auditions, came back, and the next morning, I could not speak. (laughs) So the moral of the story is, if you go to New York, York. (laughs) don't have fun. Don't have fun in New York. No, uh, I just, I'm sure I was sitting next to a bar at someone with the death cold, and they they gave it to me. So, um, So I was down. I was down for a good week. I missed Ken's opening. So that was sad, and then yeah. but I saw it, I saw it on Sunday, but then proceeded to get sick again with a fever on Monday. But yeah, yeah, you know, it is what it is. But I'm back. I only have the slight tickly, tickly cough, cough occasionally, and a couple sneezes. But I am definitely uh, like three thousand percent better than I was a week ago. <laughs> Yay! Well, Yay. and tickly cough and drippy nose is sort of par for the course it's for this just weather. Kind of late winter. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and it's good. It's been weird. Like the, it's been weird across the country. I know, but I know it's been weird here. It's been like 60 degrees one day and then it goes up to, and then it goes back to like 22. Yeah. There <laughs> was a day earlier yeah. this week where we had the, the high during the day was 62 degrees and the low at night was 27. Yeah. And not, I'm not about that. And I know that's, that is normal. Absolutely normal for like the Midwest slash Upper East Coast, like that is so normal. And because I look back at like Facebook statuses where I'm like, oh, look at me wandering Chicago on this 72 degree day like 10 years ago. So super normal, but super fucks with your body. Yep. <laughs> so we don't know if to have our air conditioning on or heat on, uh, nothing on, windows open, no idea. <laughs> so that's so that is actually um, what we have been doing is opening all of the doors and windows, wearing no clothes, nothing on, and then flipping back and forth manically between heat and air conditioning. It's It's been quite the sight to see around here. Yeah, the people in the apartments that can see us in the windows as they walk by are really enjoying it. Yeah, it's it's a bizarre, it's a you bizarre go, festival. Go visit our OnlyFans. <laughs> 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 Through the doors of... <laughs> <laughs> of of Philadelphia through yeah. the windows of Philly <laughs> only fans that's probably an actual uh only fans so I'm sure uh, it Google is Google that and at your own risk if it's not dibsity dibsity dibs <laughs> trademark 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 <laughs> yeah uh, through the windows of Philadelphia <laughs> that'd be really weird that's an adult voyeur- story it's a very voyeuristic account um but yeah so that's where I am how how how's your life been Kenneth I banged my knee really hard (laughs) folding laundry this morning. He was adulting. I have... I have a laundry injury. Yeah, we got a new bed when we moved in here, and I have cracked my knee on the bottom of it once, but he, Ken is taller, so he cracked his shin. Yeah, um, no, it was right smack dab in the middle of the kneecap, and it oh, just- Oh, it was, because you were bent over, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I whacked that fucker real good, and goddamn it hurt. Yeah, I um, heard it. I was in the living room and went, oh, baby, you okay? That was like two hours ago <laughs> as we're went, recording no. this, and it's still kind of throbby. I don't think I um, 
I don't think I damaged anything for real, no, but mostly, a, mostly just my pride. But there's going to be a real nice little welt there. You'll have a beautiful bruise and uh, the memories. <laughs> yeah, thanks for the memories. But other than that, we had a visitor. Your mom came up to see the show. Um, she see did. Georgia McBride yeah. and stayed with us. And um, we know she is a avid listener and uh, supporter and corrector of the podcast. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of uh, speaking oh, no. of corrections to the podcast, <laughs> oh, I told a story on the last episode about um, the the research she did for a company that wanted to be called Penultimate. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was wrong. It was not a pen company. Much worse, at least if it was a pen company, then it'd be punny and funny. It'd be punny and funny. No, it was like uh, some sort of financial investments company or something like that. Oh. She told me, and I'm sorry, mom, I'm sure I messed it up again. But the point of the story is it had something to do with like money, not even pens. So oh, that makes um, it way worse. Yeah, so it's even worse. <laughs> it makes it way worse because it wasn't someone being clever, it was someone who absolutely should have known what the meaning of that Just name didn't, is. Didn't put it together. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That was our last story. Was the the pun is mightier than the pee. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yep. That's why we were talking about it. Yeah, I do believe. Um, I and I'm sure there were some listeners who were concerned that the reason we didn't drop an episode last week <laughs> is Ken's brain exploded. N- no, is because after the big game, Philadelphia burned to the ground. That's right. That um, was the Super Bowl too. The, yeah. oh, see, now I have to bleep that out because NFL will sue you for saying the name of the big game. Oh, I forgot. <laughs> I always fucking forget that. It's so stupid. They're not going to sue us. We do not have enough listeners for them no. to sue us. Um, Challenge. Get us enough listeners so the Super Bowl can sue us. But, uh, yeah, you're right. I'm not going to bleep that out. Yeah. Let them come. Let them let come Bring get us. Bring it on, Fox. No publicity is bad publicity. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to an independent podcast. Yeah, uh, Philadelphia did not burn to the ground, and I'm pretty sure that's because of the last 30 seconds of the game. Yeah. <laughs> feel about it what you feel, but it was a really fucking good game. That was probably the best game I've ever, I have probably ever seen. That I can think of. of, of Certainly the, the best Super Bowl. Super Bowl it was game. the It was the the only time I've ever watched a Super Bowl, and when I got to the end, I found myself thinking, you know what? The game was the best part. Yeah. <laughs> some, some of the commercials were fine, and then there were those two weird Jesus commercials that Hobby Lobby's CEO paid for, like, that is still being talked about of, like, if you're going to be a tax-free... Um, entity of our country and of the world uh as a church maybe spending six point like eight million dollars on per commercial per commercial isn't the best use of your money to yeah. tell people to meet jesus uh how about you know like house people feed people uh help people with rehab mental health uh situations you know what Jesus would do. Anyway, I don't want to dive too deep into that because that I knew that was coming because that had been like dropped that there was yeah. some like ads that were controversial. And now everyone's being like tax, like hashtag tax the church tax, which I've been saying for years. But like clearly they're making a profit <laughs> because not everyone can afford a Super Bowl ad. Um, and this is while. People are complaining that not everyone can even find a job right now that pays a living wage, and yet we're paying $6.8 million for a Super Bowl commercial. But, you know, whatever. That's that's it. And Ken has one more weekend of his show. So if you're in if you're in the Philly, Philadelphia Jersey, area, East Coast area, come on up. Come on down. It's very good. I've seen it twice. Um, Ken has learned for the first time how to accept dollar bills at, while he's doing drag. <laughs> if, and if, you, if that intrigues you, then you will very much enjoy the Oof. show. So that's us. That's, that is us. Hi. How you doing? Um, this podcast, for those of you who may be new to the podcast, is generally speaking a comedy literary podcast, except every week we like to do a little thing we call Clown Corner. Uh, so this week for Clown Corner, I'm going to uh, cover someone that I'm a little surprised we haven't hit on yet. Uh, it was pointed out to me over this last uh, couple of weeks that we have completely ignored a major cultural touchstone in Clown Corner. I bet I know who you're By having say. not yet talked about Ronald McDonald. Oh, okay. <laughs> then I'm going to cover the other one next time. 
<laughs> Ronald is the clown who serves as a mascot for the popular burger chain restaurant McDonald's. Do you know he was a guest star at like my fifth birthday party? Or it was like sixth. A guest star? Because like it used to be a cute thing when you were a kid to go have birthday parties at yeah, McDonald's. At McDonald's, sure. Because they had like the playground in the back. Yeah. I was in the South, so it was nice out. And um, I all I really remember from the party is we were sitting in the back at picnic tables. They brought out like happy meals for everyone, and Ronald McDonald was there. Yeah. <laughs> it's fucking terrifying. <laughs> kind of weird, but you know, whatever. He was yeah. he was a popular. He was an icon. It was, you know, just add it to the reason I'm not a huge fan of clowns. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway, Ronald uh, lives in McDonald land, but weirdly, despite the land being named after him, the mayor of McDonald land is a guy named McCheese. What? Which <laughs> makes me want Mayor McCheese. I didn't know that. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, well, anyway, it makes me wonder why. They don't why... even have a McCheese. That's not even a sandwich. No, but Mayor McCheese, he like he's the mayor of McDonald Land, and then it's Grimace and the well, Hamburger yeah, know, and all that. I know them, all but... those, but I didn't. Oh yeah, Mayor never McCheese. Heard of Mayor McCheese. Yeah. All right, do tell. He's he's the guy in charge, but this isn't about him. Maybe next time I do this, I'll go in depth into the mythos of McDonald Land. Um, <laughs> And try to figure out why it's not called McCheese Land or Burger Land or using well, marketing to hook your children on our terrible food land. Well, I mean, that is absolutely what it is. <laughs> Get toys, have fries. Since his first appearance in 1963, Ronald has been one of the most recognizable mascots in the world. Mm -hmm. Ronald's originator was an actor named Willard Scott. Who did the weather as well, right? Yes, he was also a weather... Well, he became a weatherman, yeah. yes. On, like, Today Show or something. He was very famous. He was he was a well-known TV yeah. weatherman, yeah. Um, and, frankly, we could talk about him at some length in a future Clown Corner as well, because when he took over the role of Ronald McDonald, he had just finished a several-year stint as TV's Bozo the Clown. And that's who I thought you were going to cover because we have not covered Bozo. Um, and so he I was, almost did that like a couple episodes ago. So Willard Scott was one of the actors who played Bozo. But after that, he, he came and recorded several local commercials to the D.C. area um, as what, Ronald McDonald. What a weird career shift. Yeah. Because <laughs> like. I know him as the weatherman on like, it had to be like the Today Show or Good Morning America or something like that because I remember watching it as a kid um, and he was very likable. People really liked him. Mm -hmm. I mean, clearly, I mean, he played these two very charismatic, like, you know, uh, family friendly characters. Um, and, but like, he went from playing a clown to playing a clown who likes burgers to playing a weatherman. <laughs> like, what a career. Bizarre and career are, trajectory. all were very, like, famous. Oh, yeah, he was like, successful in all of them. all three of them were famous. Like, I mean, we're all lucky to get one thing that makes us, like, you know, like, uh, uh, known to the world, and he got three. <laughs> so good for you, Willard. Yeah. Uh, so Willard recorded, um, he was the original uh, Ronald, he created the character, he recorded several D.C. area local commercials before the character's national rollout in 1965 during the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Uh, and then was the first time Ronald McDonald showed up? Was the first time Ronald McDonald had a national TV spot. Okay. Uh, and then his next one was during the 1965 NFL championship game, which was, interestingly enough, the last NFL championship game before the first modern day big game. Okay. For those of you who are curious, in, in that 1965 NFL championship game, the Green Bay Packers beat the Browns. Oh, my dad will be very happy. Um, <laughs> my dad knew that. <laughs> my dad's a, a Green Bay Packer fan. I'm about to share with you uh, that first Ronald McDonald video, that first commercial. Ooh. Um, listeners, I'll add a link to it in the the little, the, the doobly-doo, the, the, the thing. The doobly-doo. Um, that is the stuff of fucking nightmares. What? Kind of terrifying, isn't Why it? Why is he wearing a cup instead of a nose? Well, that was the that was just that was the first pass at his look. That's fucking terrifying. Yep. <laughs> also, his like makeup. I don't know. It just looked. 
I didn't like it. <laughs> I'm glad they changed the way he looked. Well, fortunately, that was that had more of a feeling of like when Burger King tried to rebrand and those creepy King commercials were everywhere. Oh That's what yeah, that felt where like. the the Burger King was looking was in like through staring, everybody's like window this and shit. Mask, like. Yeah. Fortunately for you and everyone who thinks like you do <laughs> that that particular clown is terrifying. Uh, circus clown Michael Palakovs, a.k.a. Coco the Clown, oh, was yeah. hired in 1966 to revamp the look. He took over as Ronald, and we got the version of Ronald McDonald we know today. Okay. So uh, Willard Scott did Ronald McDonald, but not necessarily uh, a successful take on Not Ronald. Not the version we know today. He continued to evolve. Yeah. The character just wasn't done cooking yet. Just <laughs> he was a little a little rare. He needed he was a to little be rare. more medium. Yeah. Because it's, you know, not really meat. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the two performers that most of our listeners will likely have memories of as Ronald are King Moody and Squire Friedel. Uh what? <laughs> Um, they both have names like they're sitting around the round table. Yeah. Um, so between the two of them, they were the national Ronald McDonald from 1969 until 1991. Wow. Uh, King Moody had been a TV actor with a major role in that sci-fi classic Teenagers from Outer Space. I have actually heard of that, so I guess it was um, somewhat classic. <laughs> who uh, and He also had uh, appearances on episodes of, like, Get Smart and Bonanza and The Man TV, from Uncle. He was a TV actor. Uh, and Friedel, who took over in 1985, appeared as Ronald, in addition to the commercials, he appeared as Ronald McDonald in the 1988 film Mac and Me, which was essentially an E.T. ripoff. No, no, no. Wait. In 1988, they made a feature-length movie about Ronald McDonald? No, 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 no. He just appeared as Ronald McDonald in this, like, sci-fi movie that was a cheap knockoff of E.T. Oh, man. However, he did voice Ronald in the animated feature films The Adventures of Ronald McDonald, McTreasure Island, and Ronald McDonald and the Adventure Machine. I remember the cartoons. He also appeared in the short-lived animated series The West. Wacky Adventures of Ronald I think McDonald. That's the one I remember. Yeah. It was like, you know, Saturday morning cartoon situation. Yeah. Um, oh, McDonald's tried so hard to make Ronald McDonald like the cool guy. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, uh, as I said earlier, there's a decent chance that I will at some point go into the lore and legacy of McDonald Land. And certainly those four performers that I listed um, each have clowning and performing background beyond being McDonald that, yeah. that could be worthy of their own clown corners. Well, that's nice that they actually hired real clowns, yeah. not just some weirdo to stand. Um, there was, I didn't take down the information on it, but there was one guy who, um, there was a big scandal because he claimed f to have been Ronald McDonald, like a national Ronald McDonald and McDonald's wasn't acknowledging him. And he said, no, it was me. It was me. It was me. Turns out he was the stand in, like the lighting stand in yep. for like three commercials in the mid nineties. Yeah. And he Either he was confused and thought that that was actually him in the commercial, or he was just weird and wanted it was attention. A little special, yeah. yeah, little little needed. In <laughs> all right, wow, okay, Ronald McDonald. Yep. Now I really want some motherfucking fries. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we'll make up some fries later. Mm, French fries. <laughs> Order some Five Guys. Fuck off! Do not say the name. <laughs> See, Five Guys doesn't need a clown. They don't need a clown. Their burgers sell themselves. Yeah. Shit's delicious. <laughs> but clowns and um, hyping up our favorite burger restaurants is not <laughs> primarily what we do on this podcast. Primarily, as I said, this is a literary comedy podcast where we read short stories that we pull out of the obscurity of the public domain. Ooh, how academic of us. Yeah, we're real smart. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to this podcast makes you a better person. I'm not going to lie. I know we always joke about it, but I always feel smarter at the end of the episodes. Well, Despite all the like fart humor and yeah. dick jokes, I always feel a little smarter. Mm -hmm. uh, so this week I have chosen a um, 
a story for Heather to read to you, sight unseen, and it's going to be really exciting. What's it going to be? Or it's going to be really boring, or it's going to be very funny. I honestly <laughs> don't know. know what we the story know. is going to be like. But before we get to the story, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on our author. So here are some fun facts. <laughs> Timothy Shea Arthur, better known as T.S. Arthur, was born on June 6th. T.S. Eliot? Not T.S. Eliot. No, T.S. Arthur. Arthur. Uh, okay. June 6th, 1809, uh, in Newburgh, New York. Okay. By 1820, Arthur's family had moved to Baltimore, where little Timmy briefly attended local schools. Good job, Timmy. Uh, at age 14... Uh, Arthur apprenticed to a tailor, but he was terrible at it because he had crappy eyesight and he hated physical labor. <laughs> I love, I like that tailoring is considered physical labor to him. <laughs> it's like sitting by, I mean. Well, you do have to like pick up the bolts yes, of cloth I mean, and move, like there's a lot of. I used to work at the costume shop. I know it's yeah. physical labor, but I think of when I hate physical labor, I think of like construction worker or mm-hmm. like fucking like furniture builder. Like, yeah. Not against anyone who builds costumes because, fuck, my back usually hurts after doing, like, costuming because you're over a sewing machine the whole time and bending down. But that's just funny that he's just like, I don't like doing anything with my hand. He basically doesn't like working with his hands. Yeah. Uh, Anyway, he he ended up finding a job. Or putting a measuring tape into men's crotches. That that could have been the deal breaker. That was probably it. Yeah. That's got to be awkward. Or maybe he just kept sticking himself with a needle. Oh, that hurt. That's a fucking bitch. Right? It hurts. I stab myself a lot when I worked at the costume <laughs> shops of many places, yes. For whatever reason, he didn't like it. Plus, he was terrible at it because he had bad eyesight and he eyes. couldn't. Yeah. So he was probably just so picking put, up cloth and carrying. Like, that was all yeah. he was doing. He was, like, um, doing the dirty work. But he found a job doing paperwork for a wholesale merchandiser. Um, and uh, he ended up living and working as a young adult, mostly in Baltimore, doing that. Uh, T.S. devoted much of his time, in fact, as much as he could, to reading and writing. Uh, And by 1830, he had started appearing in some local literary magazines, just little shorts that he was writing up. I like that he couldn't see, but he loved reading. (laughs) He found some good glasses. He probably found some really good reading glasses. he found some reading glasses. Ben Franklin had invented the bifocal by then. He got he got the large print Kindle. Version. <laughs> uh, the 1830s were super frustrating for him as he made several failed attempts to become a professional writer. In 1840, he wrote a series of newspaper articles on the Washingtonian Temperance Society, a local organization formed by working class artisans and mechanics to counter the life ruining effects of alcohol. D- depends on how you use it. <laughs> uh, the articles were widely reprinted and helped establish Arthur in the public eye as an author of the temperance movement. Oh, no. He joined the cult. And yep. That's how he got, he got famous. Yeah. Uh, so Arthur. Not, not that saying being sober is a cult. <laughs> <laughs> Just I find I find people that say all or nothing to be very scary. Yeah. <laughs> like. <laughs> <laughs> if we can't have it, you can't have it. Man. I don't want to, so you should. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like mind your business. Let people live their life. Uh, Arthur moved to Philadelphia in 1841 oh, hey to be near the offices of America's most popular home magazines, um, because all of the like better homes and gardens types magazines were being printed here at yeah, the time. The 1800s. Yeah. This was very much the hot spot. He issued collected editions of his stories and tales almost every year and published many novel-length narratives. So he was writing a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, Really, he just liked writing, this guy. Uh, He launched a monthly magazine called Arthur's Home Magazine in 1852, humbly named after himself. I was going to say it. (laughs) Creative with the name. (laughs) Uh, Helped by a very capable assistant, Virginia Townsend, the magazine survived into uh, survived until several years after Arthur's death in 1885. So it did did okay. Nice. Uh, The magazine featured Arthur's own short stories and tales, as well as other originals by other authors, and articles and stories reprinted from other sources. In 1854, for example, Arthur published. Apparently, with permission, Charles Dickens' short story, Hard Times. Oh. 
1954 was also the year 1854? Arthur. 1854. 1854. Thank you. I was like, damn, he old. <laughs> uh, yeah. So 1954, he's, <laughs> he's 140 years old, and he's getting ready to play Ronald McDonald. <laughs> uh, 1854 was also the year Arthur published Ten Nights in a Bar Room, the story of a small town miller, probably based on his own father, who gives up his trade to open a tavern. The novel's narrator is an infrequent visitor who, over the course of several years, traces the physical and moral decline of the proprietor, his family, and the town's citizenry due to alcohol. Jesus. Um, Yeah. (laughs) I was about to say, wow, he went from writing temperance, like, papers to... Writing a story about a guy who opened a bar, but then, of course... Yeah, the bar uh, the ruins bar everything. The, the, the devil. Yeah. Uh, so this novel sold well, but it actually became much more popular ba- uh, because of a stage adaptation based on the book. Oh. Um, also called Ten Nights in a Bar Room. Um, so starting in the mid-1950s and running deep in... Starting in the mid-1850s and running deep into the 20th century, that play was continuously in production. It was never not being produced somewhere for like 60 years. Well, yeah, it was like a a, a warning. Yeah. It was like the reefer madness of uh, (laughs) of for drinking. It was was the reefer madness of the time. Yeah. Uh, If you drink, it will burn to the ground. (laughs) There are also at least two film adaptations. What do you call it? Propaganda films? There we go. Propaganda films, yeah. Yeah. Uh, T.S. Arthur died on March 6th, 1885 at the age of 75 years old. Ironically, at his of an alcohol overdose. <laughs> home in Philadelphia. No, but his death was attributed to kidney problems. Well, so. <laughs> not, yeah. not necessarily related at all, but you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, So this week, you'll be reading his short story, The Last Penny, from his 1852 collection, Booze is Bad. (laughs) No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I wish it was called that. I was like, what? Um, from it, it is the last penny, but it's from his 1852 collection, The Last Penny and Other Stories. Okay. <laughs> Let's start this fire. <laughs> The Last Penny by T.S. Arthur Thomas Clare, a son of St. Crispin Ooh, St. Crispin's Day Crispin, Crispin (laughs) Once more into the breach Dear friends Thomas Clare, a son of St. Crispin Was a clever sort of man Though not very well off in the world He was industrious, but as his abilities were small, his reward was proportioned thereto. Oh, he was well-meaning, but not very good at stuff. Oh, well, you know, the world needs those, too. (laughs) His skill went but little beyond half-soles, heel taps, and patches. For who, willing to encourage Thomas, ventured to order from him a new pair of boots or shoes, never repeated the order. Mm. Oh, he's a cobbler. He's a cobbler who just kind of sucks. He's a, he's a shitty cobbler. <laughs> oh, I hope something cute. I hope this is like schmool or something. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, I'm a, okay. Shitty cobbler. Here we go. It's a shame. I like a good cobbler. Well, maybe he gets better. Maybe a fairy godfather comes and helps him be better at it. I'm, I have a feeling he's going to have something happen to him exciting. Or there wouldn't be an entire story about him. I want a <laughs> cheeseburger and a blackberry cobbler. Mm. <laughs> Stop it! <laughs> okay, so people ordered shoes from him and they were like, mm, that was sweet. I, I like to think that everyone in town would... like They'd like draw straws for who had to order a pair of Thomas's shoes this week. To like, you know encourage yep. him and like be like that but it was like but you never have to do it again once you once you lose the lottery yep. you never have to do it again it's the prank they pull on everybody new who moves yeah, to town everyone was telling me like oh here's a coupon to thomas's cobbler shop <laughs> oh i feel bad for thomas oh i want i hope thomas has a great exciting story in front of us So they never repeated the order. That would have been carrying their good wishes for his prosperity rather too far. As intimated, the income of Thomas Clare was not large. 
Industrious though he was, the amount earned proved so small that his frugal wife always found it insufficient for an adequate supply of the wants of the family, which consisted of her husband, herself, and three children. It cannot be denied, however, that if Thomas had cared less about his pipe and mug of ale, oh no, oh no, uh, it's gonna be, it's gonna be a don't drink story. <laughs> all right. He dr- he smokes he He's smokes tobacco drunk. and he drinks. Oh no, he must be a horrible piece of shit. Uh, <laughs> the supply of bread would have been more liberal. <laughs> daddy, daddy, I just want some bread. Could you please stop drinking and smoking and buy me some bread? And there's the please, propaganda. Daddy. <laughs> but he had to work hard and must have some little self-indulgence. I agree. Yeah. Like, you have a rough you're 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 trying to be a cobbler. You know you're not very good at it. And occasionally you want to just sit in your room and have a beer after work. But he had to work hard and must have some little self-indulgence. At least, so he very unwisely argued. So our author disagrees. Yeah. This self-indulgence cost from two to three shillings every week, a sum that would have purchased many comforts for the needy family. (sighs) Is this going to be a... a, 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 Sorry. If you can't afford rent, cutting out your Starbucks every day is not going to make up the difference. It's just I not. I mean, it will. Oh, Starbucks? That's like five bucks a day. Right, but For it's 30 a, days, there's a there's that's... a much sure. Okay, if you're spending five bucks a day on coffee, and but, but like my point is, people who live in poverty, it's yeah. not because well, they drink too much coffee. Yes, so that's like the thing that the fucking like one percent or the elites like to say now. Yeah. They're like. Well, no wonder these millennials can't afford a house. They're drinking Starbucks coffee and, like, going on vacations. It's like, whoa, whoa. So because we live where we don't make much money, even though we work our asses off, we're not allowed to, like, enjoy life at all? Like, fuck you. And that's that's kind of, yeah, that's that's the thing. It's like, you're allowed to indulge in what you want to indulge in, like, within reasonable limits and, you know, uh, as a human being, you're allowed to have joy in your life. So far, this feels like sober capitalist propaganda. Yeah. <laughs> the oldest of Claire's children, a girl 10 years of age, had been sickly from her birth. She was a gentle, loving child, the favorite of all in the house and more especially of her father, little daddy's girl. Mm. Little Lizzie would come up into the garret where Claire worked and sit with him sometimes for hours, talking in a strain that caused him to wonder, and sometimes, when she did not feel as well as usual, lying upon the floor and fixing upon him her large, bright eyes for almost as long a period. Lizzie was never so contented as when she was with her father, and he never worked so cheerfully as when she was near him. Sounds like a good papa. Yeah. (laughs) Gradually, as month after month went by, Lizzie wasted away from... (laughs) Now we have dying children. Gradually... Just staring up with big eyes. It's like, Daddy, I love you and you're cobbling. (laughs) Papa... Oh, man. Please. please. Oh, man. (laughs) Put down your beer and buy me bread, Papa. (laughs) Sounds like he's working his ass off while she's sitting there. (laughs) Lizzie wasted away. Well, it sounds like she was born sick. (laughs) So this has, like, nothing to do with anything. This is just 1800s medicine again. (laughs) No, it's not. It's because Dad drinks. Oh, that's right. I forgot. This is God casting down revenge because Dad drinks. That's right. That's right. Never mind Jesus made wine. Jesus knew what was up. (laughs) If you actually study what Jesus did throughout the Bible, Jesus was cool as fuck, man. (laughs) He's going to brothels and, like, hanging out with the freaks and the, like, the quote-unquote freaks and, like, drinking wine. Giving poor people money, drinking wine, walking on water. That's pretty dope. I mean, fuck. Part, like, helping, well, that was God, I guess. (laughs) I was going to say, helping Moses part the Red Seas. That was his daddy, but, you know. Um... (laughs) Jesus he, was just doing the thing. He went to the market and flipped out and turned over all of the capitalists' tables. Yeah, he's like, you fucking pieces of shit. Just give it away. Let's all, like, be in a hippie commune together. 
<laughs> Dirty commie. Dirty hippie. <laughs> All right, Lizzie's wasting away with some disease. Lizzie wasted away with some disease, for which the doctor could find no remedy. Her cheeks became paler and paler, her eyes larger and brighter, and such a weakness fell upon her slender limbs that they could with difficulty sustain her weight. She was no longer able to clamber up the steep stairs into the garret or loft where her father worked, yet she was there as often as before. Claire had made for her a little bed, raised a short space from the floor where she lay, talking to him or looking at him as of old. He rarely went up or down the garret stairs without having Lizzie in his arms. Usually, her head was lying upon his shoulder. Again, she sounds like a really yeah. sweet dad. Like, he's like, honey, you're sick. You can't climb the stairs. I'll carry you up, and I'm going to build you a bed. <laughs> And thus the time went on. Claire, for all the love he felt for his sick child, for all the regard he entertained for his family, indulging his beer and tobacco as usual. Fuck, the guy the guy deserves a beer if he's this is what he's dealing with. <laughs> indulging his beer and tobacco as usual, and thus consuming weekly a portion of their little income that would have brought to his children many a comfort. No one but himself had any luxuries. Not even for Lizzie's weak appetite were dainties procured. It was as much as the mother could do out of the weekly pittance she received to get enough coarse food for the table and cover the nakedness of her family. <laughs> oh, how about mom go get a fucking job? <laughs> <laughs> hey, mom, go sweep someone's floor. <laughs> it's the 1850s. Women aren't allowed to work. I... They were. I mean, they could only do like three things, yeah. but like she could absolutely do something. <laughs> to supply the pipe and mug of Claire from two to three shillings a week, which were required. This sum he usually retained out of his earnings and gave the balance, whether large or small, to his frugal wife. So he earned the money and then. <laughs> how dare he? How dare he use it? No matter what his income happened to be, the amount necessary to obtain these articles was rigidly deducted and as certainly expended. Without his beer, Claire really imagined that he would not have the strength sufficient to go through with it. Okay, so that's when there's a problem. That's a problem. Okay, now okay, now we're now we're going into territory of uh addiction or, you know, at least um um uh, uh ob obsession with Without his beer, Claire really imagined, or superstition at least, <laughs> Claire really imagined he would not have the strength sufficient to go through with his weekly toil. How his wife managed to get along without even her regular cup of... What? I like the idea that it's superstition. He doesn't even drink the beer. He just believes that he has to buy it. So he just fills the mug and sets it there while he's doing his work. Well, like, it's like, it's almost like a uh, an OCD act. Like, it's like... Okay, so when I finish my job, like I finish my daily job, I smoke a pipe, I have one beer, and then I go downstairs, and then it's like, dude, it you're the worst becomes, drunk ever. It's like, because he's not even getting drunk, he's having a beer. <laughs> he's having a beer. <laughs> um, well, as far as I, I guess they haven't said yeah. how many beers he's having, but I assume a beer. Um, Let's see. Claire, da, da 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 His wife managed to get along without her regular cup of good tea. It had never occurred to him to ask. And has she asked him? Or is this like one of those things where she's just like... Ugh. Expects him to know. Like, just figure it out, Claire. <laughs> Thomas. Thomas Claire. Uh, t -t 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 -t. So his wife didn't get her good tea and he never asked about it. And not to have a pipe to smoke in the evening or after each meal would have been a deprivation beyond his ability to endure. So, the two or three shillings went regularly in the old way. When the six pences and pennies congregated in goodly numbers in the shoemaker's pocket, his visits to the alehouse were often repeated and his extra pipes smoked more frequently. But, as his allowance for the week diminished and it required some searching in the capacious pockets where they hid themselves away to find the straggling coins, Claire found it necessary to put some check upon his appetite. So he is controlling it. Yep. 
So what's wrong with it? There's nothing wrong with this. So he'd, he'd have a little more when he had a little money and he'd do a little and less when he And he could cut back when he couldn't, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm excited to see where this is going. Claire found it and started to check on his appetite. He's going to give Lizzie a beer and she's going to be all it's better. It's going to be all better because, or actually he's going to give her some whiskey because that is the cure for all things. And so it went on week after week and month after month. The beer was drunk and the pipe smoked as usual while the whole family bent under the weight of poverty that was laid upon them. Uh. You know, that's the one thing I didn't try when I was sick because I was on that, like, like I was doing the snatched, like, diet. I didn't, never didn't. I never did some, like, hot toddies or, yeah. like, a little shot of whiskey. Or <laughs> See, that's why I was sick Next for time. so long. That's why I was sick for so long. No whiskey. No whiskey or oh, wine whiskey, or anything. I love you. It's perfectly <laughs> clear. <laughs> weaker and weaker grew little Lizzie. From the coarse food that was daily set upon her, her weak stomach turned, and she hardly took sufficient nourishment to keep life in her un... In, uh, attenuated. Attenuated frame. Ooh, what's that mean? Skinny? Tiny? Wi- sick? Weak? <laughs> uh, beer-fueled. Beer-fueled frame. Okay, cool. Attenuated. Having been reduced in force, effect, or value. Okay. So... Tiny. Tiny. Sickly. So, uh, they hardly took sufficient nourishment to keep life in her attenuated frame. Poor child, said the mother one morning. She cannot live if she doesn't eat, but coarse bread and potatoes and buttermilk go against her weak stomach. Ah, me! If we only had a little that the rich waste. (laughs) She's not dramatic at all, Mom. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I agree. She's also not wrong. She's not wrong, but fucking potatoes sound great. (laughs) I want some potatoes. Yeah, if bread and potatoes are too, like, upsetting upsetting your stomach, that's about as bland as it gets. Yeah, that's pretty much what I eat when I'm sick. (laughs) Maybe she has celiacs. Oh, she's (laughs) gluten-free. That's it. (laughs) This is where the gluten intolerance begins. Don't be intolerant. (laughs) If we were all more tolerant, life would be easier. It's true. It's true. Ronald McDonald would agree. (laughs) Have a burger. There is a curse in poverty, replied Claire with a bitterness that was unusual to him as he turned his eyes upon his child who had pushed away the food that had been placed before her and was looking at it with an expression of disappointment on her wan face. A curse in poverty, he repeated. Why should my child die for want of nourishing food while the children of the rich have every luxury? This is true. This is some yep. fucking, like, this is current, current news here. In the mind of Claire, there was usually a dead calm. He plodded on from day to day, eating his potatoes and buttermilk or whatever came before him and working steadily through the hours allotted to labor, his hopes or fears in life rarely exciting him to an expression of discontent. But he loved Lizzie better than any earthly thing, and to see her turn with loathing from her coarse food, the best he was able to procure for her, aroused his sluggish nature into a rebellion against his lot. But he saw no remedy. "'Can't we get something a little better for Lizzie?' said he, as he pushed his plate aside, his appetite for once gone before his meal was half eaten. "'Not unless you earn more,' replied the wife. "'Cut and carve and manage as I will. It's as much as I can do to get common food.' Claire pushed himself back from the table, and without saying a word more, went up to his shop in the garret and sat down to work. He's going to make a pair of magic shoes. Here we go. (laughs) He's going to make a pair of Christmas shoes. Yeah. Oh, no. Jesus. Is is this the origin story for Christmas shoes? So that at least when his daughter dies, she can look good for Jesus. Oh, God. Oh, no. There was a troubled and despondent feeling about his heart. He did not light his pipe as usual, for he had smoked up the last of his tobacco on the evening before. But he had a penny left, and with that, as soon as he finished mending a pair of boots and taken them home, he meant to get a new supply of the fragrant weed. Ooh. (laughs) 
That'll help her feel better. That'll make her appetite better. That, yeah, that could help. Wait, is this like the introduction of medical marijuana it's to the world? <laughs> Anti-booze, pro-marijuana. Yeah. The boots had only half an hour's work on them, but a few stitches had been taken by the cobbler when he heard the feeble voice of Lizzie calling to him from the bottom of the stairs. That voice never came unregarded to his ears. He laid aside his work and went down for his patient child, and as he took her light form in his arms and bore her up into his little workshop, he felt that he pressed against his heart the dearest thing to him in life. And with this feeling came the bitter certainty that soon she would pass away and be no more seen. Oh, my God. Jesus. This is a rough story, dude. Uh, Come on, T.S. Give me some some clowns. I'm waiting for clown or magic shoes or a fairy godfather or some shit. You said fairy godfather twice, and now all I can picture is like Harvey Firestein in little fairy wings. Um, That's fucking brilliant. I hope I hope Harvey Firestein's my fairy godfather. But it's but so it's Harvey Firestein in little fairy wings, but he's doing Marlon Brando from The Godfather. Can Harvey Firestein do voices? I'm pretty sure his voice is the only I mean, thing I that think comes it's up. It's just this one. I think that's but what it is. He could do the like I made him made him offer he couldn't, couldn't refuse. refuse. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Back to the dying child. Um Thomas Clare did not often indulge in external manifestations of feeling, but now, as he held Lizzie in his arms, he bent down his face and kissed her cheek tenderly. A light like a gleam of sunshine fell suddenly upon the pale countenance of the child, while a faint but loving smile played about her lips. Her father kissed her again and then laid her upon the little bed that was always ready for her and once more resumed his work. Claire's mind had been awakened from its usual leaden quiet. The wants of his failing child aroused it into disturbed, disturbed activity. The wants yeah, of his, so he's freaking the yeah, fuck out yeah. and he starts stitching those shoes yeah. real quick. The wants of his failing child aroused it into disturbed activity. It's like, oh, my brain, it's ignorance is bliss. It's the ignorant. He was very ignorant to like the situation and the like the, um, intensity of the situation because he was happy with his potatoes and buttermilk. Yeah. <laughs> he, he was happy with the daily the daily blah de, blah blah but all of a sudden now he's like oh shit and his he's he w- guys he's woke. Yeah. I'm just worried that the end of this story is going to be so he stopped drinking and they lived happily ever after. <laughs> <laughs> Which you know works for a lot of people when they have a problem. <laughs> But not. is this just a dare ad? It's a dare ad. Oh no! <laughs> just say no. <laughs> Claire's mind had been okay. La, 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 da, 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 da. Thought beat. <laughs> oh, thought beat. There we go. Yep. Thought beat for a while like a caged bird against the bars of necessity and then fluttered back into panting imbecility. <laughs> that is a fucking fabulous sentence. <laughs> That's like so visual of like what goes on in your head when you are overthinking and like manic. Yep. It's like thought beat for a while like a caged bird against the bars of necessity and then fluttered back into panting imbecility. <laughs> Like you're like that. up, you're like up pacing, and then you have to sit still for a minute and just be like, fuck, and just kind of fuck, 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 and then well, get up and. <laughs> it's it's also the thing of like you do a ton, and then you just you beat yourself into a drooling mess. Yeah, and you're just staring at the floor for five minutes, and then you get up again, and you're like, what can I do? What can I do? At last, the boots were done, and with his thoughts now more occupied with the supply of tobacco he was to obtain than with anything else, Claire started to take them home. As he walked along, he passed a fruit shop and thought of Lizzie, and the thought of Lizzie came into his mind. If we could afford her some of these nice things, he said to himself, they would be food and medicine both to the dear child. But he added with a sigh, we are poor, we are poor. Such dainties are not for the children of poverty. He's going to go buy the tobacco. <laughs> I'm going to have issues with the moral of the story, but yeah. we're going to continue reading it. Yep. Because then we're going to have a discussion about how this is about propaganda. About the evils of drink. About, well, no, we're going to have a talk, you about, a talk about the evils of capitalism. 
If we could afford her some of these... Oh, wait. That's... that's I just said yep. that one. He passed along until he came to the ale house where he intended to get his penny worth of tobacco. For the first time, a thought of self-denial entered his mind as he stood by the door with his hand in his pocket, feeling for his solitary copper. This would buy Lizzie an orange, he said to himself, but then was quickly added, I would have no tobacco today nor tomorrow, for I won't get paid for these boots before Saturday when Barton gets his wages. Capitalism. Capitalism. Then came a long, hesitating pause. There was before the mind of Claire the image of the faint and feeble child with the refreshing orange to her lips, and there was also the image of himself in cheered for two days long by his pipe. But could he for a moment hesitate, if he really loved that sick child, is asked? Yes, he could hesitate, and yet love the little sufferer. For to one of his order of mind and habits of acting and feeling, a self-indulgence like that of his pipe or a regular draft of beer becomes so much like second nature that it is as if it were a part of very life. And to give it up costs more than a light effort. So yes, it was just his ha- it was, it was it's his, a habit. It was his habit. Like... I have my pipe and I do this. It was like his, his, his superstition. The penny was between his fingers and he took a single step toward the alehouse door, but so vividly came back the image of little Lizzie that he stopped suddenly. The conflict, even though the spending of a single penny was concerned, now became severe. Love for the child plead earnestly and as earnestly pled the old habit that seemed as if it would take no denial. It was his last penny that was between the cobbler's fingers. Had there been two pennies in his pocket, all difficulty would have been immediately vanished. Having thought of the orange, he would have bought it with one of them and supplied his pipe with the other. But, as affairs now stood, he must utterly deny himself or else deny his child. For minutes, the question was debated. I will see as I come back, said Claire at last, starting on his errand, and thus, for the time, making a sort of compromise. As he walked along, the argument still went on in his mind. The more his thoughts acted in this new channel, the more light came into the cobbler's mind, at all times rather dark and dull. Certain discriminations never before thought of were made, and certain convictions forced themselves upon him. What is a pipe of tobacco to a healthy man compared to an orange to a sick child, uttered half aloud, marked at last the final conclusion of his mind. And as this was said, the penny which was still in his fingers was thrust determinedly into his pocket. As he returned home, Claire bought the orange and in the act experienced a new pleasure by a kind... This this orange is going to cure his daughter and she's going to be better. Well, vitamin C is good for you. Oh, vitamin C is good. I mean, I would have bought the orange, too. <laughs> like, it's like, I can go without it for a couple. Like, I don't need to smoke yeah. a pipe tomorrow. It's fine. I'll get her an orange, see if it makes her feel better. And, like, that's good. I mean, so I compromise. I probably would have gone in and bought the tobacco and then beat up the fruit seller and taken I all the oranges. stolen an yeah. orange because fuck, fuck capitalism. Steal all the oranges. <laughs> Just like pop and then, one in the pocket. And then burn down the tavern and just stand next to it and get secondhand smoke inhalation. Get really high. <laughs> uh, do, 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 do. Claire brought the orange and in the act experienced a new pleasure. By kind of necessity, he had worked on daily for his family, upon which was expended nearly all of his earnings, and the whole matter came so much as a thing of course that it was no subject of conscious thought and produced no emotion of delight or pain. But the giving up of his tobacco for the sake of his little Lizzie was an act of self-denial entirely out of the ordinary course, and it brought up its own sweet reward." When Claire got back to his house, Lizzie was lying at the bottom of the stairs waiting for his return. He lifted her as usual in his arms and carried her up to his shop. After placing her upon the rude couch he had prepared for her, he sat down upon his bench, and as he looked upon the white shrunken face of his dear child and met the fixed sad gaze of her large earnest eyes, a more than usual tenderness came over his feelings." Then, without a word, he took the orange from his pocket and gave it into her hand. Instantly, 
there came over Lizzie's face a deep flush of surprise and pleasure, a smile trembling around her wan lips, and an unusual light glittered in her eyes. Eagerly, she placed the fruit to her mouth and drank its refreshing juice, while every part of her body seemed quivering with a sense of delight. What the fuck kind of orange is this? <laughs> that's a that's a special orange. <laughs> that's why it was so expensive. That's this a, a penny. <laughs> I mean, this is like 1850. Yeah. It's <laughs> a lot this of is, money. This is the second time something has happened and it talked about a light on Lizzie's face. Yeah. And I, I and I genuinely expected it to start talking about some supernatural being yeah, like, coming in. Yeah, like an angel. I like... really thought Harvey was about to show up. <laughs> Harvey. Is that good? Is that orange good? You like that orange You kid. like it? <laughs> Is it good, dear? At length asked the father, who sat looking on with a new feeling at his heart. The child did not answer in words, but words could not have expressed her sense of pleasure so eloquently as the smile that lit up and made beautiful every feature of her face. While the orange was yet at the lips of Lizzie, Mrs. Clare came up into the shop for some purpose. An orange? she exclaimed with surprise. Where did that come from? That feels like lazy writing. Yeah. She came up to the shop for something. For something. For For some purpose. For some. uh, She's like, I came up to complain that we have no fruit again. She came up to no. That came to the shop for some. Came up to the shop for afternoon delight. Her noise hadn't heard. No. She was looking for Lizzie. Like she was. They're not having sex anymore. She didn't want a fourth kid to pay for. (laughs) They should have stopped a couple ago. I (laughs) think. An orange, she exclaimed with surprise. Where did that come from? Oh, mama, it is so good, said the child, taking from her lips the portion that yet remained, and looked at it with a happy face. Where in the world did that come from, Thomas? asked the mother. I bought it with my last penny, replied Claire. I thought it would taste good to her. But you had no tobacco. I'll do without that until tomorrow, replied Claire. It was very kind in you to deny yourself for Lizzie's sake. <laughs> I mean, isn't that just isn't what that you should do? What you were, well, also, like, wasn't that kind of what you were, it, it, like, intimating, like, at the dinner table of, like, we we never have anything nice if you would just... So, basically, she was just, like, passive-aggressively telling him to do that, and he finally figured it out on his own. Communication is key in a marriage. <laughs> um... In any relationship. In any relationship. Uh, So maybe people out there listening, if you have three children and one of them is super sickly and a spouse who is spending half of your earnings on tobacco and beer, just say, hey, dial back the tobacco and beer and buy me a fucking orange. (laughs) If only it were that simple. Isn't it? No. This was said in an approving voice and added another pleasurable emotion to those he was already feeling. Uh, is this, this feel, is also feeling very Christmas carol yeah. Like, if you give something, you will receive so much more in return, which is true, I would mm-hmm. argue. The mother sat down and for a few moments enjoyed the sight of her sick kid. <laughs> that sounds horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like looking at a sick kid to bring a smile to my face. I just love watching my sick kid. <laughs> just, Jesus. She enjoyed the sight of her sick child as, with unabated eagerness, she continued to extract the refreshing juice from the fruit. When she went downstairs... When she went downstairs and resumed her household duties, her heart beat more lightly in her bosom than it had beaten for a long time. Not once through the whole day did Thomas Clare feel the want of his pipe, for the thought of the orange kept his mind in so pleased a state that a mere sensual desire like that of a whiff of tobacco had no power over him. You have no power you over have me. have no power over me. Thinking of the orange, of course, brought other thoughts, and before the day closed, Claire had made a calculation of how much his beer and tobacco money would amount to in a year. This is exactly what we're just It's, <laughs> yeah. The sum astonished him. He paid rent for the little house in which he lived, two pounds sterling a year, which he had which he had always thought a large sum, but his beer and tobacco cost nearly seven pounds. What the fuck? 
That's a cheap She's, house. <laughs> well, but for comparison, what that means is he is spending on beer and tobacco three times his rent. That's insane. Okay, he does have a problem. <laughs> or the proportionate amount of rent versus, well, what's he, two pounds sterling? Is sterling a higher amount than a regular pound? No, so the the pound. Well, it's a is, coin. It's it's a coin, yeah, but it's based on. Uh, it's called a pound sterling because its value is the worth of a pound of sterling silver. Oh, okay. Okay, so seven pounds in eighteen fifty two is worth about one thousand two hundred and fifty pounds today. So their house was only two pounds. Seven pounds is what he spent on booze. Right. That's a cheap house. Yep, that's three hundred and fifty seven dollars a year. Fuck. Yeah, he's spending way too much on tobacco and booze. <laughs> that seems insane. He went over and over the calculation a dozen times in doubt of the first estimate, but it always came out the same. Then he began to go over in his mind the many comforts seven pounds per an- annum <laughs> per year would give his family, and particularly how many little luxuries might be procured for Lizzie, whose delicate appetite turned from the coarse food that was daily set upon her. Lizzie sounds like she's a fucking bitch. <laughs> she's just a child who's a lot of work. <laughs> she's like, oh, I'm Daddy, I'm so sick of potatoes. <laughs> I like oranges. I want oranges. Oh, I want it now. <laughs> No, Daddy, no. I want it now. I want the world. I want the whole world. Not just bread and potatoes. No, I don't. I want some fucking oranges right now, please. (laughs) (laughs) That was a weird sketch. (laughs) But to give up the beer and tobacco in Toto? (laughs) I think that's supposed to say total. I like Toto. I like that he's shoving this beer and tobacco into Dorothy's dog. (laughs) That's how he's smuggling it in. Oh, yeah. Up a dog's butt. Oh, yeah. That's like what they do, you know, in uh, no movie ever, I hope. Jesus Christ. You you put it up your own butt all you want, but the second you involve an animal or a child, then you can go fuck off. It's the temperance movement's equivalent of a drug mule. Yeah. It's a drug dog. It's a, yeah, it's a... Well, it's a drug dog, but the opposite of what you actually think that means, yeah. Yeah, Actually, (laughs) it's probably a brilliant way to smuggle drugs, because dogs always smell each other's assholes anyway. So, like, (laughs) that's not going to be out of the ordinary. It's going... And the, the cop's like, dude, like, no, we can't have, you can't go on a date right now. Like, like do your You're job. You're working. <laughs> but to give up the I'm be- going to look at every seeing eye dog in the airport very differently yeah, from now right, on. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> every, uh, 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 what's, uh, emotional support animal, et cetera. And for every cartel lord who's listening, and I know we have a few of them who are regular listeners, uh, you're welcome. But to give up the beer and tobacco in total, when it was thought of seriously, appeared impossible. How could he live without them? On that evening, the customer whose boots he had taken home in the morning called in, unexpectedly, and paid for them. Claire retained a sixpence from the money and gave the balance to his wife. With this sixpence in his pocket, he went out for a mug of beer and some tobacco to replenish his pipe. He stayed some time, longer than he usually took for such an errand. When he came back, he had three oranges in his pocket, and in his hands were two fresh buns. (laughs) Yeah, there were. Ooh! (laughs) Hot cross buns. (laughs) One a penny, two a penny, hot Hot cross cross buns. (laughs) Second verse. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> in his hands were two fresh buns and a cup of sweet new milk. No beer had passed his lips and his pipe was yet unsupplied. He had passed through another long conflict with his old appetites, but love for his child came off as before the conqueror. Lizzie, who duped Lizzie, who drooped about not duped. <laughs> she drooped. Lizzie, who drooped about all day, lying down most of her time, never... Oh, bother. Oh, I'm sad. My name's I'm Lizzie. I'm so droopy. <laughs> little did we know, all I needed was a little vitamin C. 
surprising the doctor didn't tell them that. Doctors don't know anything. The doctor was like, she was just born small. She's going to (laughs) die. Lizzie, who drooped about all day, lying down most of her time, never went to sleep early. She was awake, as usual, when her father returned. With scarcely less eagerness than she had eaten the orange in the morning, did she now drink the nourishing milk and eat the sweet buns, while her father sat looking at her, his heart throbbing with inexpressible delight. From that day, the pipe and mug were thrown aside. Ta-da! It cost... In favor of his throbbing heart. <laughs> yeah. While he watches a little girl drink milk. Yep. Yeah. That's it. That's that's all. It cost a prolonged struggle, but the man conquered the mere animal, and Claire found himself no worse off in health. He could work as many hours, and with as little fatigue, in fact, he found himself brighter in the morning and ready to go to his work earlier, by which he was able to increase at least a shilling or two his weekly income. Even though he still sucked at his job, he could work longer. He could work longer. He could just be yeah. terrible longer. <laughs> yeah. Added to the comfort of his family, eight or ten pounds a year produced a great change, but the greatest change was in little Lizzie. For a few weeks, every penny saved from the beer and tobacco the father regularly expended for his sick child, and it soon became apparent that it was nourishing food more than medicine that Lizzie needed. She revived wonderfully, and no long time passed before she could sit up for hours. Her little tongue, too, became free once more. (laughs) Daddy, Daddy, you were such a fucker. Like, watch your tongue, young lady. (laughs) But it's free! (laughs) Fuck shit ass. (laughs) Her little tongue, too, became free once more, and many an hour of labor did her voice again beguile. And the blessing of better food came also in time to the other children. <laughs> That's nice. I like oh, that. yeah. Eventually, they fed their other kids, and too. And themselves. You know, for a while, it was just Lizzie. And the blessing of better food came along also in time for the other children and to all. So much to come from the right spending of a single penny, Clara said to himself as he sat and reflected one day. Who could have believed it? And, as it was with the poor cobbler, so it will be with all of us. We... (laughs) There are little matters of self-denial which, if we had but the true benevolence, justice, and resolution to practice, would be the beginning of more important acts of a like nature that, when performed, would bless not only our families, but others, and be returned upon us in a reward of delight incomparably beyond anything that selfish and sensual indulgences have in their power to bring. The end. (laughs) And that was a... Um, so the moral of that story is capitalism. Now, if you're spending three times your rent a year on booze, you might have a problem. Uh, yeah, you need you do. You should look at that. You should definitely look at that. But you are allowed to indulge in something sometimes, people. <laughs> Health is not about just eating the right amount of calories and working out every day and um, skidding all your sleep. You also have to have things you enjoy in life or that's not healthy. <laughs> that's called that's. I, yeah, also, I'm listening to these people's diet, and it sounds like they were seriously protein-deprived. Uh, they're still protein-deprived. Yeah. <laughs> they still haven't had any protein. Like, the, I don't see any beans. I don't see any fucking chicken or beef. Like, they're eating milk, p- bread, and oranges. Yeah, yeah. That's not healthy. <laughs> no, you know what they need? Fucking cheeseburger. They, they need Ronald McDonald. This episode brought to you by McDonald's. <laughs> Did somebody say... I'm loving it. <laughs> um, I'm not loving the moral of that story, but you know, um, I, I, we knew that was coming. I think yeah. because we read his history, um, and he strongly leaned into the fact that he had a captious audience. <laughs> yep. Um. Uh. You know, it, it is what it is. Uh. I, I'm glad he uh realized his daughter was important. Um, 
you know. Yeah, I mean, and there there are things there are things to oh, yeah. be taken from that story. Like, yeah, there you do need to decide what's important to Budgetary you and decide issues. to focus yeah. focus your energy on the things that are important and blah blah blah. I'm just immediately cringy about anything that is temperance movement because, um, well, because among other things, and like I get. It worked out in the story. Good for you. That's great. And there are people like I know that if if you struggle with alcoholism, or then the solution addiction, yes. the solution is to cut it out entirely. Mm-hmm. Because if if that's something you struggle with, then like it sucks. But you don't get to be a social drinker yeah. because one is going to trigger you, and it's yeah. going to lead to more and more. Yeah. But for the vast majority of people, the issue with the temperance movement is it takes the worst case scenarios and applies it to everybody, which is what. All things like any anything in excess is bad. Yeah. Like for the most part. I mean, working out in excess is actually bad for you. Yeah. Um eating only buns and oranges <laughs> is probably bad for you. Yeah. Uh, what I don't love is the whole idea of uh because we're we're poor, we can't have we shouldn't be allowed to enjoy nice yeah. things. And like I said, why didn't the wife just have a conversation with him about it? <laughs> she just sat there bitching in the kitchen like, oh, oh, my husband works all day. And then he goes out and has a drink and smokes his pipe. Oh, and we're dying. But I'm not going to tell him. <laughs> like, how about say something? Just makes be a, like, makes hey, a honey, better story if she's passive aggressive. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, um, uh, how did you feel about that story, friends and family? What would you do with your last penny if you didn't have any kids? I feel like this goes really well into what's going on with Chelsea Handler right now. What's going on with Chelsea Handler So Chelsea Handler, um, if you don't know, hosted The Daily Show last week as a guest host. And Chelsea Handler has always been very open about like she's very like content being single and childless as an adult woman. Like that was her choice. And that is awesome. Like that's what she's also been. She's been very outspoken about like I don't condemn anybody's choices. I have friends with 50 kids. I hope not 50, but like I have friends. With, a lot of children. I have friends with five children and I have friends with 12 dogs and single, you know, like I have everything in between. And. Fox News, surprisingly, went on a fucking rant about her, specifically Tucker Carlson, but a bunch of people, of being like, oh, it's so funny. Like, it's so, like, she thinks she's happy. She thinks she's she's promoting this image that women can be independent and alone and be happy. And clearly she's miserable because no woman could be content. Like, they went on a, like... Straight out of, like, the 1950s, like, fucking, like, Stepford Wives handbook rant. And Chelsea Handler responded with, fuck you. You know what I'm doing right now because I don't have a kid? I'm drinking this bottle of wine. (laughs) Fuck you. I'm now, I'm in Paris today. Like, so, yes, once you have children and you have a family, you need to, like, prioritize your spending. It, But if you're a single woman... Do what the fuck you want. <laughs> Man, fuck Tucker Carlson. Yeah. Fucker Carlson. Yeah, well, he is a piece of shit. But yeah, I've been following that and it's quite it's quite entertaining cuz Chelsea Handler doesn't give a fuck. Uh, and like she's going to bat right now for like like are you serious right now? Like I can do whatever, like, that was my choice. Like, it doesn't make me less valid of a person or more valid as a person. It's just my life, and I can do with it what I want. Um, And this guy has three children, and, you know, you got to take care of the kids. That's very important. But I still argue that you should uh, allow yourself some joy in the world, even if that's just a, like, walk to the park. So, dear listener, when you share this episode on social media or whatever, please share it with the hashtags, it's my life and fuck Tucker Carlson. Yes. (laughs) Or fucker Carlson. (laughs) Hashtag fucker Carlson. Let's see if we can make hashtag fucker Carlson go viral. Ooh, I like that one. <laughs> Him and his Eminem fucking self. <laughs> yeah, dude. Like He's gone off the deep end recently. 
I think he's indulging so, in too many beers. <laughs> they melt in your mouth, but not in your hand. What happens when you fuck them? <laughs> Tucker Carlson will know, <laughs> apparently. Uh, but he doesn't want to fuck them anymore because they're not wearing high heels. Right. So. They're not sexy enough. Not sexy anymore. I hate it when my chocolate isn't sexy. It's just not cool. <laughs> Dove chocolate. <laughs> yeah, now he yeah. only now he only eats Dove because it's got a sexy voice. Oh person. God, I want Mike Tyson to become the spokesperson for Dove chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Dove chocolate, if you're listening, <laughs> and we have a pitch for you. <laughs> um. So hey, listeners, write in. Let us know what you would do with your last penny or. Apparently, a penny is worth a lot more than I'm thinking. So, I'm what would you do? Dollar. What would you do with your last? It's confusing, right? Because like, a dollar won't buy you anything either. A dollar's barely going to buy you an orange. I got a fifty cent Lacroix yesterday. It's, it's not. <laughs> it's not going to buy you a pack of cigarettes. Yeah. It's not going to no, buy you a beer close. unless it's Dollar Draft Night. It's like PBR. Yeah. <laughs> like you're at the hipster bar and they got Dollar PBR Night. Yeah. yeah. Um. What, what would, would you, you what would you give up for an orange? <laughs> what would you do for your dying child? <laughs> Not to play light, but yes. <laughs> That's what the story was about. Yep. All right. Uh, so write in, let us know what your thoughts are about that one. When you write in either to 5050artsproduction at gmail.com or any of our social media accounts, which you can find by searching for Campfire Classics Podcast on you know, any of them, uh, please include this week's secret passcode, which is panting imbecility. Panting imbecility. <laughs> Hashtag fuck Tucker Carlson. Yeah. Speaking of panting imbeciles. Yes. There you go. Um, anything else from you? No, I'm good. Great. I want to go eat an apple, not an orange, because uh, I prefer apples to oranges, as Colbert um, often asks in his quiz. <laughs> right, right, because you can put peanut butter See, on an apple. See, if they'd just given her a fucking apple to keep the doctor away, they yeah. gave her orange, and she had to keep eating them. <laughs> just have one apple a day. So then you don't need all the sweet cream and shit, the, the buns and all that. <laughs> an apple a day keeps the doctor away, but you know what else keeps the doctor away? Not having health insurance. Thanks, Obama. <laughs> and on that note, this has been Campfire Classics, where we try to read those books that look really good on your shelf. I don't even have anything clever to say after that. <laughs> but I do have health insurance because of Obama. So, so seriously, so really, thanks, thanks. Obama. <laughs>